Right now I'm in northern Utah. I find myself in the middle of the North American continent, surrounded by mountains, canyons, rivers, lakes, continental environments. But if I could go back in this very spot about a hundred million years ago, I'd find myself in the middle of a sea with fish and ammonites nibbling my toes and who knows who else. swimming around in a Cretaceous Sea, in particular the Maori Sea, which existed about 97 million years ago, and it stretched all the way from Canada down to the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, and even parts of Utah. Now if you've been to any of those places, you might have noticed that the sea has since receded, but not before leaving behind evidence of its existence in the form of fine sediments and fossils, and that's what we're going to take a look at today. So let's go. Maori consists of gray, fissile, siliceous shales, like this stuff you see eroding out of the hill behind me. Siliceous deposits are those with a high silica content. The silica comes from biogenic sources, like radiolarins, siliciflagellates, sponge spicules, and diatoms. After burial, this silica-rich debris is altered and combined with surrounding sediments, minerals, and metals to form rocks like chert, diatomite, siliceous shales, and porcelainites. In addition to these interesting lithologic and mineralogic components, the Maori shale formation also contains some peculiar fossil finds. Fish scales and otherwise disarticulated fish remains are fairly common. I split the shale open and we can see in the fine matrix a concentric fish scale right there. Sometimes just scattered fish scales are found, but sometimes we also find the other fish remains, like bones and teeth, along with the scales. It was noted that there was a general scarcity of other marine fossils in these layers. There's another nice fish scale right there. There's also an occasional shark tooth or ammonite. At first, researchers wondered if these were the fecal remains or regurgitations of predators. But some of these fossil lenses that included fish scales, teeth, bones, and small coprolites were studied and they were determined to instead be storm lag deposits. They pointed out that the bones weren't etched as might be expected in a coprolite, and there was no sign of gradual deposition, as in uh, gradation or finding upward. There was also a lack in background phosphatic matrix, and the quartz and the micro coprolites just didn't fit either. Instead, this all seemed to point to winnowing storm currents on a gently sloping shelf environment. Something else that's interesting are the ammonites we find in the shale. I mentioned there was a general lack of other marine fossils, and when they are found, a lot of times they're poorly preserved. In fact, ammonites were found in flat impressions. I have an ammonite impression right here that's from the Maori shale. As you can see, these are generally hard to identify to the species level because of the condition they're left in. Hey, just a real quick message from me, Heather, the host here at Let's Go Geo. Actually, I am host, videographer, photographer, editor, creator, all that stuff. This channel is run solely by me, and I started it because I do love geology and all things related to the topic, and I love teaching, and I thought it would be a great way to bring to people that in the field experience, but digitally. So Let's Go Geo was born. The project's going well, but I have a lot of great other ideas. So if you want to help me out, support me, and help the project move along, you can find me on Patreon, and you can become a fan there as well as get access to exclusive content. So head over to Patreon. Otherwise, let's get back to today's topic. Researchers Coben and Larson did identify two ammonite species of the Maori shale. In fact, one of them is endemic to the Maori Sea, and that's the hoplitid ammonite Neogastroplites, and the other was an invader to those seas. The well-researched biostratigraphy of ammonites helps us better understand their relative ages to one another, the environments in which they lived, and how their environments were changing around them, especially in the Cretaceous when the seaways were constantly shifting due to tectonism and eustacy. If you want a great paper that summarizes the biostratigraphy of ammonites and changes in the western interior seaway during the Cretaceous, 
check the description. I'll put a link in there to some research by Josh Slattery. There's also a bentonite rich layer towards the top of the formation called the clay spur bentonite beds. They're about seven feet thick and there are some thin beds of sandy material as well. Maori also plays a very important role in oil and gas resources in the west. Maori is part of the Mancus Maori Total Petroleum System, and that's all part of the Greater Uinta Piance Basin Petroleum and Gas System. And when researchers looked at this greater system in Utah and Colorado to see what resources were available still, they found that the Maori Mancus system represented 7 of 21 trillion cubic feet of gas. The Mesa Verde represents 13 of the 21. The transgression and regression cycles that are represented in the Cretaceous really helped with oil and gas formation. And the shales like Mancus and Maori represent seals while the sandstone formations like the Frontier and Dakota sandstones serve as the reservoirs. And in the Mesa Verde group we see lots of these sedimentary units from shales on to sandstones and so we have a lot of seals and reservoirs. Altogether, that's why these units represent such a big part of oil and gas resources in the West.